Praise the Lord. Revelations chapter 2. It is speaking of the church at Ephesus. These, of course, are... Revelation is beginning the... Uh, Jesus' letter to the church. And Jesus is the one that is giving this message. Jesus is the one that is sharing this. Uh, it really isn't John that is saying this. It is John recording it, but it is Jesus saying it, speaking it. Jesus is the one that is within the midst of the church. Jesus is the one that is walking amongst us. And as we see this, we would see that the seven stars that he holds in his right hand... It says in the seven golden candlesticks, the stars are the, the pastors in the, of the seven churches and the candlesticks are the seven churches. He says that in the last verse of chapter 1. And it is Jesus that walks amongst the churches and he is walking amongst us now. And however we want to try to interpret this, whether we want to say that each one of these churches was a age of a church or whether we want to understand that this is uh, that within the world right now one of these seven churches is is one of us however we we want to think or however we might interpret it I think that it would be a neglect on our part if we don't apply it to our individual heart what I want to bring out today is the the letter that Jesus gives to the church at Ephesus and apply it to our heart today to make sure that we are where we ought to be with the Lord. It says in verse 1, it says, Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things, saith he that holds the seven stars in his right hand. Remember, the seven stars are the pastors. And who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And verse 20 of, of chapter 1 tells us that the candlesticks are the seven churches. I know your works and your labor, and your patience, and how you cannot bear them which are evil, and how thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you, because you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Praise the Lord. Father, we come to you this morning, and I thank you for your word, that it does not return void. It is There is power in the very word of Jesus Christ. That your word went forth, and the world was formed. Your word went forth, and mankind became a living vessel. You breathed life into him. Lord, we thank you that you spoke the word and demons flee. We thank you, Lord, that by your word that has gone forth, that it, you promise it will not return void. And Lord, I ask you this morning that your word would go forth. Accomplish what you would have. Give me the words to say, Father. Lord, I have nothing on my own. I am in need of your anointing. I am in need of your Holy Spirit. And Father, I ask that this word that you've given me, that you burden my heart with, Lord, may you establish it and give me clarity in my mind, clarity in my speech, that, Lord, you might accomplish and use me however you would. Yes. We bind the enemy away. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. Amen. This morning's message is first love. If you can think about what Jesus is saying, he has told the church in Ephesus how he has saw their patience. He knows their works. He, he sees the trials of their faith. He sees how they have endured hardship, how they hated those who stood up and professed to be men of God and apostles and yet were not. That he, Jesus saw the, the fervency that this church had in wanting to keep 
in the sense a narrow way of not wanting to pollute or pervert, of wanting to walk that straight path. But then he says, I have something against you. You've left your first love. And we might think, well, this is a, a minor thing, but we got to understand that by leaving the first love, it was so severe that he says, unless you repent and unless you come back to your first love, I'm going to remove your position as a candlestick. I'm going to remove your position of the church from its place. But he doesn't leave them hopeless. He tells them, but you have to repent. So what I want to give today is the message first love. Have we departed and left our first love? What is he talking about here? I think as we would, would see this, there was without a doubt, we've got to understand that the first love that he is speaking of is understanding the cross of Jesus Christ. When you got saved, when you came to know Christ as your Savior, the cross of Christ was what was in your heart. And there was no doubt about it. And if somebody argues that, I will argue that they were never then born again. Because if we did not see the exceedingly sinfulness of our sin, and then correlate that God loved us, that He gave His only Son to die for me, if, if when we did not, at the moment of conversion, have our heart reflecting on the love of God towards us, that He died for me, shed His blood for me, then I will argue that we never got born again. Because it was by the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, that we are saved. He is our first love. I know that I can speak of my own conversion, of my own salvation, the night that I was saved. I saw the exceedingly sinfulness of my soul. And this is one area where the church today has written so many books to try to promote psychology and to promote how good you are within. And this is the opposite of the gospel. That is why as the church accepts these types of teachings, they move so far from their first love because before you can know how exceedingly great God's love is for you, you must know how exceedingly wicked you are. We understand that. That without knowing how exceedingly sinful we are, we won't truly understand the love that God gave for my wretched soul. When I see how sinful I am, that even on my best day I fall short, that my sin has rose up like an odor before God, and it is a putrefying leprosy before the Lord. All of these things are symbolic and scriptural, as we would see how bad I need a Savior. And then that God would send forth His love for me, and that while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. He didn't wait for me to get cleaned up. It was impossible. He loved the world and its wickedness so much that while I was yet in sin, Christ gave His Son, or God gave His Son. That is the love of God. So if I depart from understanding how sinful I am, I won't understand truly the love that God has for me. The other thing he says here, he says, I have someone against you because you've left your first love. There are many who speak of the cross and they speak of the sacrifice of Jesus and yet they have no heartfelt love or relationship with Christ. Jesus and what he did is just a religious thought. It is a, a necklace around their neck. It is a, a picture on the wall and there's no heartfelt conversion that takes place. I want to read something that J.C. Ryle, who was an English, uh, uh, an English preacher 200 some years ago, and I believe even though uh, people might say, well, that was an old, old time thing, I, I got to tell you, when I'm reading books, I'm not reading new releases. I'm reading books that were written a long time ago that were written by men and men of God who understood the old paths, yes. who they understood before they became a great falling away to the point that we're at today. Yeah. And, and, and this is what J.C. Ryle wrote. 
He says, Mark what I say again. You may know a good deal about Christ by a kind of head knowledge. You may know who he was and where he was born and what he did. You may know him by his miracles, his sayings, his prophecies, and his ordinances. You may know how he lived and how he suffered and how he died. But unless you know the power of Christ's cross by experience, unless you know and feel within that the blood shed on the cross has washed away your own particular sins, unless you are willing to confess that your salvation depends entirely, entirely on the work of Christ and what he did upon the cross, unless this be the case, Christ will profit you nothing. The mere knowing Christ's name will never save you. You must know his cross and his blood or else you will die in your sins. And Jesus says you've left your first love. You have turned from that relationship that you had when your heart was overwhelmed with love and gratitude of knowing Christ died for me. He shed his blood for this. And when we depart from that, when we have turned from that, we have missed the mark. There are things that we can disagree on. There are things that denominations can have that are, are, are not quite in, in the same unity of thinking. But I've got to tell you today, if the cross of Jesus Christ is one of them, then we are not in unity. We will not, I will not call a person my brother or my sister if we get the cross of Jesus Christ wrong. Lord. If we get that mark wrong, we miss it all together. Yes. If we depart from our first love, yes. then Jesus says, I will have no part with you. I will cut you off from your position because it was by the blood of Christ and Him alone that we are saved and forgiven. If we miss that mark, we miss everything. We miss heaven. Yes. We must recognize today, have I left my first love? When I first was saved, when I first knew and was overwhelmed by the love of God, that His love was shed upon me, that He gave His life. That day when I gave my heart to Jesus, and I with and I gotta tell you, tears are not the mark of salvation. Amen. But tears rolling down my eyes as I saw my wretchedness, my filth and my sin. And yet Jesus was willing to forgive me. Yes, that love that filled my heart to think what a great Savior I have. What a glorious Father that loved me so much that He would give His only Son for me and that Jesus would give His precious life and leave everything uh, 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 above to save a wretch like this sinner. On my best day, I am a sinner saved by the grace of God. I am no more. I am only saved by the goodness of God shown upon me and His great love that He has given for me. And if I re reject that, if I depart from that, if I turn from that, I miss everything. He said, I have somewhat against you. You've left your first love. He says, you've got to remember from where you have fallen. And I want to bring out a couple things. Verse 4 says that they have left it. It doesn't say they, they lost their faith, that they lost their first love. It wasn't something that fell out of their pocket and they didn't know where they put it. It was something that they departed from. They willfully ex replaced the cross of Christ with something else. Yeah. And I want to say today, we do the same thing in church when we place ordinances and religious ceremony above the cross and the blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah. When we replace uh, superstitions above the cross of Jesus Christ. Superstition is something that is all over the church today. That we, we whether it's the Catholic, I mean the Catholic church is probably the, epi the epitome of it. Whether it is uh, the, the prayer beads or uh, after you pray and you do hand motions or whatever it might be. Whether 
it's the, the, the thought within the Christian church that you have to go and you have to attend a church in order to, to, to be forgiven. I was saved outside of a four church wall, uh, out of the church walls. Amen? And I think if you really think about it, uh, probably most of us here today have been saved outside of the church. I know, you, Brother Adam, you were saved on a street, on a sidewalk. Amen? I was saved in my home. Amen? I know several of you here were saved in your home. Yeah. How God has moved in the hearts and lives of people outside of the church walls. Yeah. That is how God works. That is how God moves. And if we depart from that, if we turn from the first love that we had, and I'm afraid we do it even as we gradually replace that love that we had for Christ, the knowledge of what He did for us, we gradually replace it with traditions and with uh, superstitions. He says, you've left it. You didn't lose it. You left it. He says, you better repent. He says, and realize where you've fallen from. And you better go back and do the first works. Yes. You better go back to what it was when you first believed. Or he says, or else I will come upon you quickly and I will remove your candlestick out of its place unless you repent. He gives a very clear-cut message. There's got to be a turning away from the path you're, we're heading towards and we got to get back to the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. It was at the foot of the cross where I was saved. Amen? Uh, I want to say Paul Bunyan. I get John Bunyan and Paul Bunyan messed up. Is it Paul Bunyan or John Bunyan? John Bunyan, praise the Lord, uh, wrote Pilgrim's Progress. And I believe that man, when he wrote that book, he was in prison for the gospel of Jesus. And I believe the Holy Spirit gave him that book. In fact, I had read that, and I don't know if this is entirely accurate, but apart from the Bible... Pilgrim's Progress is one of the most circulated books that has been circulated and translated into so many different languages. And it has been for several hundred years, it has circulated the, the, the globe as it has been a witness of the Pilgrim's Progress walking with Christ. And if you recollect, if you ever read that book, when old Christian had that burden upon his back. And see, the church today wants to get rid of that. They want to say, just don't acknowledge that burden. But see, you have to know that that burden is so great before you realize you've got to find a, the cross that will, will, will remove it. Amen? And Paul, uh, John Bunyan uh, wrote of that man that had that burden upon his back that was so great. And he... And he was looking for a way to be released from that burden. And until that day, he saw the cross. And the burden of his soul rolled away. Amen. The book, and the book describes that it rolled off of his back the moment he believed. The moment he beheld the cross. And that's what Jesus said. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And that's what that serpent wrapped, the brazen serpent around the cross around the pole symbolized in the wilderness, and anyone who would look upon it would be healed of their snake bite. That snake bite symbolized the curse of sin, the, the, the work that the devil had done to corrupt mankind, the burden on my soul. It was a sinful work that was killing me. And until I looked upon the cross of Christ, my first love, it would kill me. But I looked upon him, and when I did, the burden of my soul rolled away. And he described it rolling down the hill, down into an empty tomb, and it was never to be seen again, praise God. Jesus was dead, crucified for me, dead and buried for me, and rose again for me. And if we leave that, if we turn from that, if that is not the only thing we're looking to, then we have left our first love. And he says, repent and come back and do the first works. You've got to come back to the foot of the cross where you first believed and you stay there. Yep. You keep the cross before me and the world behind me. Amen. You keep the cross in front of you and you keep living by faith. You keep looking to Jesus. He's the only thing that will get us through. Have we left our first love? 
Oh, I pray we haven't. I pray we've not replaced the cross of Christ with superstition or with some legality, with church ordinances. I pray we haven't. Even though there are so many things within the church that are good, that are, are, are God-given, yet it does not replace faith in the work and the blood of Jesus. That is our first love. That is where we first believed. In closing, I want to read this. He says, Nevertheless, I have someone against thee because you've left your first love. This refers to the Ephesians' first deep love and passion for Christ and His Word. This warning teaches us that knowing correct doctrine, obeying teaches, uh, obeying some of the commands, and worshiping in the church is not enough. The church must, above all, have a heartfelt love for Jesus Christ and His Word. Sincere love for Christ results and a single-hearted devotion to Him, purity of life, and a love for the truth. Yes. When we love Jesus more than anything else, give me Jesus or give me death. Amen? Amen. Give me Jesus. I love His Word. I want His Word to go before me. Yes. His, the, 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 the first love of when we first believed, that's where we got to be at. That's where we must remain. And if we've strayed from it, or we've started to go down the wrong path, repent, he says, and get back. Yeah. Or else you're going to miss out on everything that I've prepared for you. Because it was by the cross of Christ that I'm saved, and it's by the cross of Christ I see glory. Yeah. And nothing else. Amen? If you bow your heart with me today. I pray none of us have lost our way. I pray that none of us have replaced the cross of Christ, the blood of Jesus, and faith, trust in that work with religion, with legalities, with church ordinances. Because just as we said, when we were, when we were first saved, many of us were saved outside of the church walls. Many of us were saved apart from even being preached to by a pastor. It might have been a trap that was left for us. It might have been we picked up the Bible and we read a scripture. And wherever we were, in our heart repented of sin and we believed. Yeah. With simple faith, we just said, God, I believe that you did it for me. We had a vision of the cross. We had a vision of the blood shed for me. And the love that God had for me, that while I was still a sinner, He gave His best. And Jesus died. At that moment, my heart was changed. And then my walk began to follow. Praise the Lord for that walk that follows a converted heart. Fruit of repentance. Have you strayed today? Those who might be watching this over the internet, have you strayed today? Have you left your first love? Do you remember those days when you first believed and you trusted full heartedly in what Christ did for you? But now you look to yourself and you realize, I'm not where I once was. I've left my first love. The, the pitter-patter of my heart that... That, that I wake up every day and I want to seek God and say, what do you have to give to me today, Lord? What do you want to tell me today, Lord Jesus? Have you left that? Has that died and gone away? Have you left the first love that you had for Christ? If you have, there's still hope because He says, repent. You're not too far gone. You've not gone so far beyond the edge that you're lost forever. Right now, that feeling in your heart that God is pulling you, that's the Holy Spirit saying, Repent, lest I come upon you and remove your place. There's still hope for you. Return to your first love. Return to Him. And it's done by faith. Repenting the same way you got saved the first time. The same way you first believed. He says in verse 5, he says, repent and do the first works. Just like you first believed, 
Go back to do the same thing. You repented of your sin. You looked to Christ and Him alone. That's what we do today. Every day. Because tonight when we lay our head, our head on the pillow and we go to sleep, tomorrow's a new day. And you're going to have to choose. I'm living for Jesus. The cross before me and the world is still behind me. No turning back. No turning back. If you're watching this over the internet and you want to accept Christ as your Savior, if you say, Pastor Lathan, I know that I'm not right with, you, with, with God. I know that I'm not right with the Lord. I want you to, to say this prayer with me. I want you to right now in faith. There's nothing magical about the sinner's prayer. There's not a repetition of words that you can say. It is all done from the heart. Whether it is by the grace of God that you cry out and say, Jesus, save me, like Peter did while he was sinking. Or whether you are able to, to kneel at an altar, wherever you might be at and you're watching this. God is looking for your heart to repent and trust in Him. Cry out to Him today. As you say this prayer with me, believe it in your heart. You're crying out to Jesus. Heavenly Father, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I recognize I am a sinner. And my sin separates me from God. I need Jesus. And I recognize that it was the blood that was shed for me that forgives me. Forgive me for departing from my first love. And I come back. I recognize by faith that it's Jesus and Jesus alone that saved my soul. Come into my heart. Wash my sin away. Forgive me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as the heart crying out in faith. If you said that prayer... The Bible says the heavens are rejoicing. Angels are singing glory, glorious hymns in heaven. And your name was written in the Lamb's book of life. The church at Ephesus, he tells them, return. It, it, they had done some fine things. And he got, Jesus complimented them for, their, for the things that they had done. But the departure from their first love was enough to make them miss out on heaven. That's where we got to keep our heart. Keep our focus on our first love. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Praise God.